Hello and thanks for joining us for the France 24 interview. Today's guest is hot off the back of performances at South Africa's World Cup, Damon Albarn's Africa Express and a recent Grammy nomination. He's established an impressive international career by developing his own brand of his father, Fela Kuti's Afrobeat music. He's become Nigeria's most successful living musician and his new album, Africa for Africa, shows he's still fighting the authorities through music. I'm delighted to welcome Femi Kuti to France Van Kat. Welcome. Thank you very much, Eve. <laughs> now, you are a lot less confrontational than your father, I think it's fair to say, but you still are fighting the authorities through your music, aren't you? Well, probably you say I'm more diplomatic. And when you look at your country now, Nigeria, yes. 50 years since independence, in a new democratic era, what do you see? I see it's very hypocritical, pretentious. The leaders don't want to probe people that should be probed. So it's... Um, Somehow we still have, um, we're still blessed that the people don't want war. People want to move the country forward. People in the streets are, they love the country very much. People like me, the nurses, the doctors, the lecturers, the students. So nobody wants trouble, but the leaders seem to not get the country on the right path. I think that's wrong. So there's still a lot of corruption in high places and the leadership is still not leadership by example. So the doctors are still very unhappy, but they still go to work. The lecturers are still unhappy, but they still teach. And that's about it, really. So leadership is the problem? Yes, definitely, because the leadership is very pretentious and hypocritical. Would you ever consider running for the leadership of no, Nigeria? I don't, I don't want to be a politician. I want to be a musician. I only think about it because I'm, too, I'm very concerned. And I grew up in a very political home. And right outside my doorstep is poverty. As we speak, Nigeria still doesn't have electricity. Before I left Lagos, the doctors were on strike for about two months. A lot of poor people lost their lives because it, the doctors were on strike. The lecturers were, the universities were closed because they were, they were asking for more pay. So Nigeria is always facing this kind of problems. I mean, I was watching the news. CNN was talking about cholera in Bauchi State in the north. Nigeria shouldn't be facing all this with all the oil from the 70s we have been talking about since my father's time. Now I'm 48 and we are still talking about no electricity. Wow, it's wrong. In your music, you do marry politics with music. What do you see as the role of music these days in, in when governments are becoming more and more authoritarian? Do you think music can still make a difference? Yes, because mu music consoles the average person, like what music did, my father's music did to a lot of people in Nigeria. Many people couldn't speak. And when my kind of music of my father speaks for, on behalf of the society, the people come up and say, oh, thank you. You are voicing for millions of people. So music does make a great difference. Let's talk about how you first started out in music. Um, I read that back in 1978, your father shoved you onto the stage and made you play the trumpet in front of 10,000 people. Do you remember that? Yes, the saxophone. Yes, that was... It, was, it wasn't really his fault. I was boasting. I, was, I told him I was ready to take my first solo. And it was at the University of Ife, and I was like, yes, I'm ready to do it, and blah, blah, blah. And he says, OK, go in front. And I, <laughs> I just got the shivers. That was scary. And my, I couldn't even move. I was like... <laughs> said, blow, blow. I was like... <laughs> Did you feel encouraged by your father or blocked by him, would you say? It was it's strange. Today I can look back and say we had lots of fights and I can look back and say the last fight we had was we sat down and he says, OK, what are you complaining about? I said, why didn't you teach me music? Why didn't you let me go to school? He says, OK, because he wanted to prove a point that I didn't need to go to school to be successful. So he says, are you successful? Yes, kind of. Are you making money? Well, are you famous? Well, so I couldn't argue with him. So he says, I rest my case. So he proved his point, yes. Let's talk about the 70s, which is when you were first shoved onto the stage like that. Um, a time that wasn't so happy is when the Shrine, which was the nightclub where your father performed, where 
you live, the Kutis um, live. Tell us about when that was burnt down. Were, were you actually there? I was, I was coming back from school that day and it wasn't exactly where we lived. It was just across the road, just facing, this was the shrine and this was the house, just opposite. And um, it was the house that was burnt down. The club did not belong to my father. He rented the place, what everybody knew. He just walked across to the club every day. And I was coming back from school and I just saw all the soldiers. And the barracks, where the soldiers came from, was just behind, immediately behind the club. So they just like walked across to my father's house. And I was coming back from school and I just saw all the soldiers marching towards my father's house. And I knew they were going there and I just like, I was shocked. I just stood there with fright. And they said, that's his son. And I just ran back streets, went to pick up my sister, ran home, told my mother, the soldiers. But now we used to play lots of pranks on my mother. Because every time it was the police, 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 the police are there and she would go like hysterical and we're joking. It was fun for us as kids then. And this day we came, we got home and said, the soldiers are there. She said, look, stop playing this. I'm too old for all this now. Stop it, please. She said, mommy, the soldiers are there. And then we got there, the house was burnt down. We thought my father had lost his life that day. We thought everybody was dead. We got there, soldiers everywhere. It was like, wow, like a war zone. And they threw your grandmother out of the window. Yes, we thought she died. She died from the injury, injury she sustained because I think they broke her spinal cord and then she couldn't sit up anymore. And then she died from the, the throw. And that day really must have changed your life forever. It changed everything because my father became, he was very rich. He had about 14 cars. He was so famous. Everybody was, I mean, then suddenly he lost everything. Everything was burned and he became poor. Why do you think it was? That he became poor or? <laughs> that he was targeted by the authorities. Because he was very vocal. And the authorities were very upset. At that time, in 77, the first colloquium was um, held in Nigeria, where they were supposed to talk about black arts and black government and all these things. And my father pulled out of it saying the Nigerian government was not serious enough and was not making it a ser serious enough issue for the future of Africa. So he pulled out of the Festac at that time. And then immediately he released a song called Zumbi, which they got, the soldiers were very bitter about. So they were like um, very angry and were looking for any reason to burn his house. On that day, one of the boys had a confrontation with the soldier, a soldier outside the house, and he ran into the compound. The soldiers now came and said, my father should hand o over the boy. And my father says, they are not the right authorities for him to be handed over to. They should either take him to court or they should bring the police to arrest him, that he could not hand over this boy to the soldiers. And they said, okay, Wait, and they went back and they now came back and reinforced themselves and they burnt the house down. At first glance, I think, to an outsider, it seems that going into music was the easy thing for people in your family to do. But really, it was the hard thing to do, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I mean, my father was such a big name. Everywhere you went was, um, for somebody like me, was how? How would I start? It was very difficult, I think. But I knew I could not do anything else but play music. I knew I wasn't going to be a lawyer, a doctor, engineer, accountant. So I knew it was music, but how was really the problem. And the things you say in your music must take quite a lot of bravery. Why do you choose to, to put yourself at risk like that? I've never thought of that. Wow, OK, wow. I've never thought about it like that. I've just thought about it that I'm concerned. I truly, I, don't, I grew up in a home where we, my father was always talking about politics. His mother was always fighting, my grandfather. So it was like, it was like breakfast, lunch and dinner. Now to come out and not be that will have been, I think people will be asking, why did you choose not to be like this? Have you ever felt like your life was in danger? Yes, many times, many, many times, yes. Especially after building the shrine, I thought I was, and then about, in, about two months ago, 15 boys were waiting outside my home with knives and sticks and cutlass, and they just missed attacking me by inches, and I knew they were sent for me. 
and I have been having this, I've been having many feelings like this many times that, I mean, they could plan a plan for my death and so I try my best to protect my family and myself. Yes, and many times I do. Okay, well, we are running out of time. I just wanted to ask you one last thing. Good. Um, Fella, the musical. Yes. Um, it's been on Broadway in the States. It's now in London. Um, what did you make of that? And would you like to see that being performed in your hometown? Yes, definitely. I would love to see it there. And I thought it was one of the greatest things that would come out of my father's life. I was very impressed. I cried. I was so happy. I was moved. It, I thought it was a great play. I saw it on Broadway. I've seen it in England. I was very impressed. Do you think one day you might see that in Lagos? I've been assured it will come by Steve Hendel, who is one of the producers of the play. He assured me. And I would love it to be in Tokyo. I would love it to go to Australia. I would love it to go to Germany. I think it's a play everybody should see. I think it's very interesting. It shows what happened in Nigeria in the 70s. It shows the state of my father's mind. It shows what he was going through, his battles in his mind. And it was a kind of Shakespeare, Shakespeare's kind of play. It's not real Africa per se. And it's very international. So I think, I thought it was great. Well done. Okay, Femi Kuti, thank you so much for coming Thanks. and speaking to us here on France Van Cat, we're out of time. That's all we do have time for. Thanks for joining us for the France Van Cat interview. Stay with us. More news headlines are coming up.